uh, friends we are starting now today is the 210th friday group meeting the topic is a uh, Uh, topic is arrest and bail in PMLA cases. Part one is already over. It's on uh, 2nd February 2024. That was a 202nd Friday group meeting. Sir addressed on that day. Today's speaker is Mr. Justice Rata Nagamuthu, senior advocate, topmost senior advocate of this country in the criminal law, particularly. Now we have a demand everywhere in the country. Uh, southern part, particularly Andhra, Amaravati, Telangana, Hyderabad. Everyone is a uh, demanding. And, uh, Everyone is a judicial actor. Judges, for judges also. Uh, sir, now you can initiate, sir. Please, amen. Just wait, sir. One minute. Good afternoon to all of you, my friends, respected Honorable Jesse Patun Ayyam, Honorable Jesse Basant, senior advocates, and my advocate friends. I deem it a great privilege to me to address you today on the topic of bills jurisprudence in so far as PMLA is concerned. Sometime before I addressed you on the scope and power of arrest by an ED officer of any person in connection with an offence under section 4 as defined in section 3 of PMLA. I will explain to you that an officer of the Enforcement Directorate is empowered to arrest any person provided he satisfies the requirements of Section 19 of the Act. I do not intend to once again go into Section 19 because enough I have done on Section 19. Now let me go to the next part of the topic, namely B. You could have seen in newspapers nowadays, and also you could have seen in the website of this honorable court that a trend has now set in in this country that instead of moving straight away for bail after a person is remanded to custody. challenge is made to the very arrest itself. In several politically important cases, we have seen that such challenges are made. Even today's newspaper carries a news that such a challenge in respect of the arrest of a political, politically important person has been dismissed by the Delhi High Court. It is also a trend nowadays to challenge the order of remand made by the special court instead of moving for bail. In a case where no such challenge is made to the remand and before that no ch challenge is made to the arrest, bail applications are moved before the special court. Let us think for a moment as why this new trend has set in in this country. Never before we have experience of often parties challenging the very arrest or the very remand order. Normally when an arrest is made, the person is produced before the court within 24 hours of the arrest and the magistrate or the court concerned on being satisfied that the investigation requires some more time that is based on the case diary etc. They remand the accused and once the remand is made, we used to move for bail. Now this trend is because 
of the twin conditions, satisfying those two conditions is almost an impossibility. Unless we satisfy the twin conditions incorporated in section 45 of the PMLA, Krishna bail is ruled out. And very recently in one of the cases, this honorable court has also gone to the extent of saying that the well-known and well-recognized principle which has been in work for several decades, I can say, that bail is a rule and jail is an exception has been given a go by. Now, so far as PMLA cases are concerned, practically speaking, though it is not so specifically stated that bail is the bail is an exception and jail is the rule, it is being followed that we understand the courts have taken the view that bail is only an exception in view of section 45 of the Act. Now, when we, why, why, when we challenge the remand order or when we challenge very arrest itself, we need not satisfy the requirements of section 45.2. That is the reason why <coughs> normally there is an advice given nowadays to the parties to approach the court <coughs> to challenge the remand order and or the very arrest order itself. Very recently, in one of my cases, when I argued that the arrest is illegal, remand is also illegal, and therefore he is entitled for bail, the court was pleased to respond to that saying that you will not challenge the arrest order, you will not challenge the remand order, therefore you are precluded from raising these two grounds. I, I firmly believe that the view expressed by the court in that particular case is absolutely erroneous. So in criminal cases, at every stage there need not be a challenge, whether during investigation or during trial, challenges need not be made at every stage of the proceedings. We can wait for the final stage, in, at that stage we can comprehensively challenge everything. Therefore it is no ground now to say for the courts that you have not challenged the remand order and you have not challenged the arrest itself. This will only multiply the proceedings of the courts. Therefore this view may not be correct. Therefore my, I would submit that instead of challenging these two things, we can straight away move for bail and these two grounds are very much available for us to raise at the time of arguing a case for bail. Now under section 45, what are the twin conditions which are to be satisfied? <coughs> Condition number one is that he has not committed the offence under section 4 that is as defined in section 3. It is to be satisfied in other words, the judicial conscience of the court should be satisfied that he has not committed the offence. In such an event only, bail can be granted, this is the first condition. The second condition is that he will not commit any such offence under this act in future. So it is nothing but an assurance to be given by the accused that hereafter I won't commit any offence. But they will say, that he is likely to commit any offence. How to assess as to whether he will commit a similar offence under the Act in future or not? When the accused gives an assurance that he will not commit any offence, my view would be that the same is to be accepted simply by the courts. So, so far second condition is concerned, we may not have much difficulty. So far as the first out of the twin conditions, I feel that it is very, very difficult for the accused at that stage to tell the court that he has not committed the offence. And it is also difficult for the court to arrive at a conclusion at that stage, prima facie, that he has not committed any offence. It is because of this first condition, now we witness, even the Honorable Supreme Court recently has remarked 
how many people you are keeping in prisons under this act. So it is because of this first condition that nowadays it has almost become an impossibility to get bail. This was argued before the Honorable Supreme Court in Vijay Madanla, saying that it is very difficult. Now why I say that it is difficult? Now why in Vijay Madanla, the Honorable <coughs> Supreme Court has said, no, no, it is not impossible to get a bail, still there is a hope for you to get bail. This is a conclusion arrived at Vijay Madanla. Now, why it is impossible? Reasons are many. The first and foremost reason is that at the time when a person is arrested, grounds of arrest ought to be given to him. Now, this honorable court in Bangat Bansal said that the accused is entitled for the grounds of arrest being served in writing. Now that has been done away with immediately by another bench of this honorable court which says that it is enough that it is served within 24 hours at any rate. Very short reasons are given in the grounds of arrest to the accused. These are the reasons as to why you have been arrested. Now that will be given later also. Now when the accused is produced before the special court for remand, the court should be satisfied that the remand should be made by satisfying its judicial conscience. You take the case of any other IPC offence. When the accused is arrested and produced before the magistrate, the magistrate cannot remand the accused in a mechanical fashion. The magistrate has to satisfy himself that detention, further detention is absolutely necessary. Otherwise the court won't remand. There are a number of cases consistently holding the view that such an order of remand shall not be a mechanical order. It should be an order considering the so many aspects of the matter including the need for his detention at the stage of investigation. Apply the same principle here. When the accused is produced by an officer of enforcement department after arrest before the special court, the court should have materials first of all to find that there are there is sufficient ground or there are sufficient materials to remand him. At this stage, I want to tell you technically it is not a remand order. Remand order is to be made under section 309. The expression remand is not used in section 167. 167 speaks only of further detention. So already on arrest he is in, in the detention of the officer. Now further detention is given. So it is not remand strictly speaking. But in common parlance we call it as remand. Therefore I am also using the same expression. So when the court remands an accused, court should have sufficient materials first of all to remand. Now what are the materials before the special court? The ECIR, the arrest order and all the other materials are sent in a sealed cover not to the court but to the authority under the act and before adjudicating authority. Because this law is not strictly a penal law. The purpose, the object of this law is to prevent money laundering and to restore the laundered money or property to the economy of the nation. That is the purpose of the act. Therefore, it cannot be said that it is a penal law. Having all requisites <coughs> of a penal law and applying the uh, penal jurisprudence. Therefore, this Honorable Court Vijay Madhalal has said that it is a sui generis act. It is not a penal act. The purpose of investigation is not for the purpose of prosecution. Please understand this. The investigation cannot done by an officer under this act cannot be equated to 
an investigation that is done by a police officer under chapter 12 of crpc therefore section 154 is not applicable then the entire chapter 12 is not applicable the officer cannot file a final report namely charge sheet so this investigation cannot be equated or it cannot be understood in terms of the investigation which is done in chapter 12 of crpc now when the officer who is dealing with an ipc offence arrest and accused he has to forward the fir not to any other authority but to the court so court has got the fir now now apart from that when the accused is produced he has to produce a copy of the case diary so to make out a prima facie case that he is involved in the crime and what are the penal provisions which are made out from out of these materials for the present only on perusal of all those things the two after affording sufficient opportunity to the accused remand order is made by the magistrate but here in the, in the pmla there is no fir registered ecir it cannot be equated to an fir vijay madanlal says that it is not even mandatory that ecir used to be registered if once ecir it is it is only for the department purposes not for the purpose of court please understand when ecir is registered it is not forwarded to the court therefore the court does not have the benefit of the earliest document namely the ecir to come to a conclusion whether the accused is to be remanded to custody or not there is no need to produce the ecir at all to the court then what are the other materials produced these statements recorded in section 50 they may or may not produce so ultimately practically what they do is they produce only a copy of the grounds of arrest they produce that they get an order of remand that is the reason why we say the procedure contemplated in this act is highly unreasonable it is not like that of safeguards which are provided in crpc when an accused is produced on arrest so this is the peculiar situation that we are facing in court when you apply for bail you do not have any material in your hands at all grounds of arrest are orally said it may or may not be given it may be a very cryptic one you do not have the other statement 150 statements etc then how to make out a case before the court that he has not committed <coughs> an offence then how to inform the court or satisfy the court that the first condition out of the twin conditions is satisfied that is to tell the court that he has not committed the crime how to say that now from out of these materials how we have to place the case before the court is referring to section 3 of the act we have to tell the court <coughs> referring to vijay madan lal that in order to remand an accused first of all you should show that there was a schedule offence which was which is under investigation by the regular police or any other authority first and foremost thing a schedule offence should have been committed the person who committed the schedule offence may or may not be known may or may not be known but what is essentially required is a schedule of offence should have been committed right this first condition should be satisfied by the <coughs> enforcement director to the court then by committing the schedule of offence some property was either obtained or acquired from out of the same so as to make the property as a proceeds of crime this is the second condition 
that they should satisfy i say instead of we telling the court they should satisfy what is the second one first one crime is committed which is a schedule offense from out of the schedule offense <coughs> this property or money has been gained has been procured has been obtained for example there is a murder for gain which is schedule offense they can say that there is fir registered schedule offense is murder for gain so requirement is satisfied second one out of this murder by committing the murder <coughs> some 20 sovereigns of gold were stolen from the body of the deceased this makes the property this 20 sovereigns of gold as proceeds of crime because by committing the crime this property is derived so this property is the proceeds of crime we call it a poc this is a proceeds of crime so the when an accused is produced or when an application for bail is moved i would say <coughs> that it is a bounden duty of the enforcement directorate the officer investigating the case to satisfy the court that prima facie this property which we are now projecting is a proceeds of crime this was derived out of commission of the schedule of crime they should also prima facie show this this is a second requirement these two are criminal activities which relate to the schedule offense what are the criminal activities committing murder taking the property there are two criminal activities one criminal activity is the offense that is committed the second criminal activity is that by committing that offense this property or what was derived so this is the proceeds of crime these two conditions are to be prima facie satisfied i say before the court either at the time of remand request or at the time when a bail application is argued these two friends keep it in your mind are relating to the criminal activities pertaining to the schedule offense now commences the pmle offense money laundering what is money laundering money laundering is another criminal activity which starts which commences after the first two activities are complete first two criminal activity related to the schedule of offense are complete thereafter commences the next criminal activity that makes out an offense under the pmle pmle act section 3 says that any person please kindly i am reading section 3 for your benefit please kindly see word by word we have to read that <coughs> whoever directly or indirectly attempts to indulge or knowingly assist or knowingly is a party or uh, is actually involved in any process or activity connected with the proceeds of crime including its concealment possession or use and protecting or claiming it as untainted property shall be guilty of the offence of money laundering let us once again read the same provision because because of this provision today we are facing a lot of problems lot of people are in jail who ever any person directly or indirectly what should he should do then either directly or indirectly he should have attempted to indulge or knowingly assist or knowingly is a party 
so please mark these two words knowingly knowingly means he should know that this property which is before him is a proceed of crime is a pos he should have knowledge suppose a person comes to comes with a property and he says that it is his property and he let us take that is he comes with uh, some 10 lakhs of money you want a loan from him believing that he has got money he is a good person <coughs> he gives you 10 lakhs money you may you, you you do not know that this money was derived by committing a fraud elsewhere by committing an offence of cheating you do not know so in such a situation when the money is received by you and it is kept by you or it is used to by you it is no offence under section 3 of the act at all therefore these two expression knowingly used in two different places of this section should be noticed that is directly or indirectly to indulge or knowingly assist or knowingly is a party or is actually involved in any process or activity connected with the proceeds of crime including concealment possession acquisition or use and projecting or claiming it as untainted property shall be guilty of offence of money laundering so therefore in order to make out an offence and as defined in section 3 what is essentially required is mens rea knowledge unless you have knowledge unless you have that intention to deal with the same there is no offence at all so it is the best defence to take in any case that the accused had no knowledge at all that this is this property is a proceeds of crime he can take a plea but the problem is in respect of section 24 you may come to section 24 of the act which deals with presumption in any proceeding relating to proceeds of crime under this act <coughs> this term proceeding has been dealt with or in uh, vijay magal law to say the proceeding means proceedings before the special court that is a prosecution and proceedings before the adjudicating authority as well before both the authorities in any proceeding relating to proceeds of crime under this act in the case of a person charged with the offence of money laundering under section 3 the authority or court shall unless the contrary is proved presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering so this presumption class in section 24 is i can say with great respect is misunderstood what is the scope of the presumption under section 24 please kindly look at section 24 very closely presumption is nothing but an assumption when a particular fact is proved that is a fact is proved b fact is presumed out of that a fact is known as fundamental <coughs> fact if a fundamental fact is proved then as per law there is a direction to the court to presume the proof of b fact correct now a fact is known as foundational fact what are the foundational facts which are to be shown under section 24 because in court section 24 is just like that shown to defeat our claim for bail therefore i am referring to section 24 section 20 what are the foundational facts which are to be shown to the court before invoking the presumption and what is exactly the presumption that can be raised by the court please kindly look at section 24 in a case of a person charged with the offence of money laundering so there has to be charge of money laundering when can there be a charge 
charge will come only during trial so at the time when you ask for bail before the complaint itself is made when as soon as the accused is arrested there is no charge against him therefore it is for us to argue that you cannot invoke section 24 presumption against me at this stage if at all presumption of section 24 could be invoked it can be made only after a complaint is made the, on completion of the investigation that too that too after charges are framed in vijay madanlal this has been dealt with it is very categorically stated in vijay madanlal please kindly read vijay madanlal which says that this presumption of section 24 can be invoked only after a complaint is filed before the court complaint can be filed only on completing the investigation until then there is no complaint filed so this is the first condition to invoke section 24 what is the second one in the case of a person charged with an offence this we have dealt with of money laundering under section 3 the authority or court shall unless the contrary is proved pro presume presume what presume what presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering so there is no presumption that a property is a proceeds of crime that presumption cannot be raised there is no presumption that predicate of an schedule offence was committed there is no presumption section 24 does not empower the court or direct the court to presume that there was a schedule offence committed whether schedule offence was committed or not is to be prima facie shown by the department to the court they have to say that this is the crime number in which these are all the offences which are schedule offences that is under investigation they should show there is no presumption in section 24 that there was a schedule offence committed whether there was a schedule offence committed or not is a matter to be shown prima facie at that stage by the department and it is none of our business one two there is also no presumption in section 24 that the property that is produced before the court is a proceeds of crime there is no presumption you please look at this unless the contrary is presumed presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in any money laundering so there is no presumption that the property is a proceeds of crime then what do you presume ultimately it is a very restricted and limited presumption to say or to presume that this property is involved in money laundering <coughs> this is a limited presumption under section 24 you may also kindly see that there is no presumption that the accused is involved in money laundering there is no presumption if you look at section 29 of the Boxo Act, where also the special court is empowered to presume. The Act directs the court to presume that he is guilty of the offence. It is that presumption relates to the accused. I will read section twenty-nine now. Boxo Act, where a person is prosecuted. first foundational fact prosecution is to be shown for committing or abetting or attempting to commit any offence under section 357 and section 9 of the pokso the special court shall presume what that such person has committed or abetted or attempted to commit the offence as the case may be therefore there is a presumption relating to the accused the presumption is that this accused has committed the crime that is a presumption if the foundational facts are proved the presumption shall be that he has committed the crime but comparatively if you look at section 
24 of the PMLA, it does not give rise to any presumption against the accused at all. It does not refer to the accused. It does not say that it shall be presumed that the accused has committed an offence of money laundering, like section 29 of the Pokso. Please kindly see the expression used here. The limited presumption is relating to property alone. Section does not say presume that such proceeds of crime are involved in money laundering. That is what it says. It doesn't say that the court shall presume that the proceeds of crime are dealt with by the accused or the accused is involved in money laundering. That presumption is not there. But this provision, section 24, is often quoted for the courts that there is presumption against you that therefore you are guilty. Please, my friends, look at section 24 very thoroughly and I think that you will agree with my view on this that the presumption is not relating to the accused at all. There can be no presumption that he has committed money laundering. No such presumption. Presumption is that the property which is before the court, which is the proceeds of crime, is involved in money laundering. Therefore, after raising this presumption that this property which is the proceeds of crime is involved in the crime, then they have to prove the involvement of the accused. The involvement of the accused. So the involvement of the accused is to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. So what are the things which are to be proved beyond reasonable doubt? Number one, that there was <coughs> a schedule offence committed. Number two, by committing the offence, some property was derived. Number three, this property derived which is the proceeds of crime is involved in money laundering. This link is created by this presumption. To that extent there is presumption. After presuming that yes, this is involved in money laundering, the involvement of the accused in money laundering is to be again proved beyond reasonable doubt. So therefore, please understand section 24 thoroughly. Now what is happening in bail matter? When we are arguing, referring to the first condition, they say that there is a presumption against you. Simply they say, my humble view is that that kind of argument is to be simply rejected at, at the outset. Reason is, as I already explained to you, there can be no presumption against this particular accused. That part is to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. So, when the first twin condition is pitted against us in a bail matter, what we have to address the court is that first of all let them satisfy whether I question it or not. Let them first of all satisfy that there was a schedule offence committed by someone or even this person. <coughs> what is essential is that such offence was committed. The offender may or may not be known. Offence was committed. Second, even at the bail stage, because the provision is so stringent, they have to satisfy the court that this property has got close nexus with the predicate offence, that is schedule offence. This link is often missing. In Vijay Madanlal, it has been so clearly held that an accused may be found in possession of so many properties. 
all those properties are recovered they are produced now whether all these properties will be proceeds of crime no some may be proceeds of crime and some may not be proceeds of crime <coughs> for example an accused by committing a crime derives 1 crore money by committing fraud on a bank now he has got another 1 crore in his pocket now using 2 crores he has purchased a property <coughs> this property is certainly a proceeds of crime to what the extent is the question not the entire property which is a proceeds of crime the property to the tune of rupees 1 crore which are derived by committing the offence alone is the proceeds of crime and not the balance but not the rest therefore they have to establish before the court prima facie at the stage of bail that yes this property was derived from this offence this also should be shown by them i i am doubtful whether this is happen in courts this that is why how we have to satisfy the first twin conditions when we ask for bail this is what i i i want to tell you now in vijay mohan lal the court also has gone to the extent of saying that at that stage <coughs> the court need not go into the finer aspects of the evidence the court need not weigh the evidence at that stage it is enough for the court to balance between the personal right or in the fundamental right of the accused and the interest of the society the court need not give a very positive finding that yes he has committed the crime and there are material that to show that there are no material to show that he has not committed the offence it is negative at that stage the court need not say need not go very deep into the evidence and at that stage the court need not give a positive finding that he has committed the money laundering offence he need not say it is enough for the court to make a prima facie conclusion that he has involved in the money laundering business <coughs> if this condition is satisfied then the accused is entitled for bail why i am stressing on the fourth condition is see very recently this honorable court has held what is it the group the one of the very good this honorable court has held in a money very recently i think that one week before that their accused were arrested case was also complaint was also filed but there was no predicate offence committed they were not able to show that they have got the property they call the same as the proceeds of crime but they are not able to show as to what was the schedule of offence committed in that situation this honorable court has quashed the very case itself now what is done is by the authorities is to invoke section 66 of the act please kindly have a look at section 66 which empowers the officers to travel beyond to some extent 662 if the director or other authority specified under subsection 1 is of the opinion <coughs> on the basis of information or material in his possession that the provisions of any other law for the time being in force are cont uh, contravened then the director or such other authority shall share the information with the concerned agency for necessary action 
now we see that these ed authorities just like that enter into any house <coughs> any office any place under the guise of such where do they get the power to go and search the house of a person who is totally unconnected where do they get the power they come under this provision they say that we are already investigating a case in connection with that case we make a search here during the search we find these properties which are totally unconnected with this case which we are investigating correct so let us say that they are investigating a case involving 1 crore of proceeds of crime they are trying to recover that they go to a particular place instead of 1 crore they have find their 100 crores of amount money cash now they are concerned only with 1 crore which is the proceeds of crime in connection with the case which they are investigating but now they come to know that there is 100 crores of money kept there they got suspicion now now under section 66 they can refer the matter to the police concerned that this appears to be a stolen property or property obtained by committing any fraud or cheating we are forwarding sharing this information to you so what was a case now gives rise to a b case now in respect of 99 lakhs now 99 crores they will share the information with the local police then what the local police should do see which says on such information according to vijay madan lal the authority can the police concern <coughs> have to register a case operation they have to investigate in respect of that 99 crores so now there are two fir's already there was one fir in respect of 1 crore there is a case under the pmli also registered they are investigating now during the course of investigation of that 1 crore case they have come to know that there is some more amount in respect of which they will share the information to the local police they will now register another fir based on that fir the ed can now register another ec they can start another case that is how it is happening like a chain somewhere they register one case on the basis of one fir somewhere one fir they register they do not confine the investigation with reference to that proceeds of crime alone because they cannot investigate the schedule of one that is the job of the police or any other authority they cannot give you a finding whether this is they cannot go into the question whether any property was derived out of the crime those are the matters to be investigated by a separate being namely local police or any other authority who is empowered to do so but here when they come to the money laundering they have got exclusive power this power is not vested to the police or any other authority they can investigate this case in respect of money laundering alone when they are doing money laundering they extend their wings on all direct all four directions they can go to any place only thing they have to record is that we have got reason to believe that this money laundered money is kept here etc etc property is kept here there is some evidence some material so search is required they record that they go there they extend everything that is how the by way of chain of events one case becomes two cases and second case will give rise to third case fourth case like that that is how it is done so this section 66 has been dealt with in madai vijay madana by this honorable court and this honorable court has also approved or has confirmed the validity of section 66 and the court has held that it is within their power to gather information in respect of in respect of any other schedule offense 
and they can share the information with the local police or with the authority competent to investigate. They need not confine only to this, they can extend also. That is how section 66 has been now understood by the court. Now brother, coming back to the first condition because the time is up. I have been saying about the two conditions. First condition I was heavily explaining. I have already told you that it is for them to prove that there was a predicate upon committed. One. Two. They have also informed, they have to inform the court that in respect of the predicate upon the case has been registered which is either under investigation or prosecution is pending. <coughs> or case has ended in conviction. <coughs> Two. Third at that stage, they have to satisfy section 19 also. Section 19 says that there is a need that, that they have got materials in their hands that he is involved in the money laundering. We kindly see section 19. <coughs> if the director, deputy director, assistant director, any other officer authorized in the behalf by central government, by general or special order, has on the basis of material in his possession reason to believe that any person has been guilty of an offence, punishable under this act, he may arrest that person. So, section 24 cannot be read into section 19. Section 19 requires something more. What is that? Materials. What are those materials? Those materials would give rise to a yeah, belief that he is involved in money laundering. In that event only he can be arrested. If at the time of arrest, <coughs> there are no materials available in the hands of the authority, namely the enforcement authority, then they will not be in a position to satisfy section 45. Two. It is very essential. In other words, the Justification for arrest is also a matter to be gone into when a bail application is considered. This is my humble view. It is no matter whether the validity of arrest was put to challenge by any proceeding, either by a writ or under section 482 before. It is not at all necessary. It is my view. Positively, you may kindly consider, I have been saying that it is a duty of the ED when a bail is sought for because it is a personal liberty of an individual. When you are trying to deprive the personal liberty of an individual, we are, when you are trying to make an enroll into the fundamental right of an accused person, it is for you <coughs> to satisfy the court at the time of bail all these things. The accused does not have any material in his hands. Therefore, in my view, the court cannot expect the accused to satisfy these two conditions. It is for the ED to satisfy those two conditions to deny bail to the accused. As I told you, what they have to satisfy, not the accused, it is enough for the accused to tell the court in my personal way that I have not committed the offence. Please, you be bail. This is enough. To, in, in order to meet this demand of the accused, which is legal, it is for them to show to the court at that stage all these conditions which I already told you, prerequisites. Number one, <coughs> offence, predicate offence are committed. Number two, it is either under investigation or the prosecution is pending or the accused has been committed to. Three, the connection between the property and the offence, predicate offence. That link 
the proximity in other words they should show that by committing that offence this property was derived this also they should only tell the court it was derived from by committing the crime then they may say that these are proceeds of crime therefore you presume even at that stage you presume that the property is involved in money laundering they may say it is incorrect as i already told you such kind of presumption can be raised only after filing of the complaint so that presumption is not available at that stage therefore they have to show to the court that <coughs> this proceeds of crime is involved in money laundering this also they have to prima facie show to the court and lastly they have to show the involvement of this petitioner in that if all these conditions are satisfied if all these prerequisites are satisfied by the ed then only the court can deny bail on referring to the first out of the twin condition enumerated in section 45 of the act but what is happening now is the reverse we are asked to explain some crime is committed in west bengal how the accused will be in a position to tell the court no such offence has been committed now some properties have been derived out of there whether true or not how is it possible for the accused at that stage to tell the court no 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 there was no proceeds of crime out of there how is it possible for him third involvement of these properties in money laundering fourth they have to also show that the accused had knowledge knowingly that he had mens rea he had mens rea to deal with the property <coughs> to keep the property to possess the property to transfer the property to convert the property he had knowledge if all these conditions are satisfied then only these conditions friends ought to be satisfied not by the accused it is by humble view by the ed in such an event only bail can be denied i would say that the age old principle that we have been following in our <coughs> criminal jurisprudence as one of the fundamental principles that bail is the rule that cannot be done away with in respect of pmli offences bail is a rule it will become an exception when when you satisfy all these conditions you can say that he is not entered for bail then you can say it is an exception put him in prison otherwise bail is a rule and bail is not an exception bail is always a rule bail is to be granted because <coughs> bail the, the deprivation of personal liberty is a very very serious intrusion into the human rights of the individual into the fundamental right guaranteed under section under article 19 and 21 of the constitution of india this is my view brothers in respect of 45 one of the act and 452 is almost there now uh i think that uh, time is up with this so we can finish continue, minutes, so to put it in nutshell and uh, i i have to say few words about the second 50 of the act also here an investigation is done by the police under chapter 12 of crpc a witness can be summoned under section 161 and his statement is recorded that statement need not be signed we all know should not be signed in fact that statement has got a very limited purpose of only using the same for the purpose of contradicting the maker of the statement that too when he is examined as a prosecution witness now similar power has been given here under section 50 of the act under the 50 of the pmla any person can be summoned 
at the time when he is summoned, the person who is summoned need not be informed whether he is an accused, he is going to be an accused or already he is an accused. He is summoned. I got power. I am summoning you. Please come. That is all. They can only say in connection of this case, I am summoning you. Please appear. You have got some information. We want to interrogate you. Nobody can refuse <coughs> to respond to section 50 summons. They have to go. Now a person appears. You could have seen that they do not arrest him immediately. They record the statement. First statement is recorded. Then he has to go. Then again he is summoned. Second statement is recorded. Then he is let off. Like that any number of times a person is summoned. And lastly, finally, they summon him, they examine him, they record a statement, immediately they show him arrested. Why this technique is being followed by the ED? Reason is very simple. Under Article 23, there cannot be a testimonial compulsion of an accused. No person who is accused of an offence shall be compelled to be a witness in his own case. That is what Article 23 gives as a guarantee. It is preventive in nature. Now this honourable court, in not only in Vijay Madhala, in many cases have held, that the crucial time is the time at which the statement is recorded or statement is given by the person concerned. At the time when the statement is recorded, he is not an accused. Therefore, 23 is not applicable. So the statement is admissible in evidence. It is not hit by Article 23. In order to make the statement recorded on Section 50 from an accused, in future during trial, what they do is, they do not show a particular individual as an accused, they summon him, they examine him, they record the statement, after that they arrest. So arrest became later, when the statement was recorded, he was not an accused, therefore article 23 is not applicable. Now, why not section 25 of the Evidence Act be made applicable? This was argued before this honorable court in Tofan Singh case under the NIA, uh, under the um, Narcotics Act. Under the NDPS Act also there is a provision, that is section 67 of the <coughs> Act, under which a statement can be recorded. Now an argument was advanced before this court that though there are some officers who are appointed under the NDPS Act, like Central XI, Customs, etc., etc., officers who have been empowered to investigate and file a complaint, like the officers of ED who are doing under the PMLA. They are also equally empowered to record a statement. These statements are recorded from the accused. They, at the time when they state, the, the same technique is followed, followed there also. They record the statement, then they arrest. There also, what, what was happening was, these statements were all admitted in the evidence, this confession. They were treated as an extrajudicial confession based upon which there were con convictions, lot of cases ended in conviction in this country until Tofan Singh came. In Tofan Singh case, this honorable court held that examined the issue as to whether this statement is hit by section 25 of the Evidence Act. Section 25 of the Evidence Act relates to an accused relate to an accused and a police officer. Section 25 does not say that at the time of making the confession, he should be shown as an accused. Even if he is treated as an accused later in point of time, till the statement made by him to the police officer is inadmissible in evidence, it is completely barred by Section 25. Please look at Section 25. No confession to a police officer shall be proved against a person accused of any offence. Person accused of any offence. An argument was advanced that at the time when the statement is made, he is not accused. But this honourable court has said no. Subsequently, he is accused of the offence. 
at any point of time he is made an accused therefore section 25 is applicable but this is in respect of a police officer in vijay madan lal i got a problem now regarding vijay madan lal as i already told you when the very same argument was advanced before the honorable colonel tofan singh that though the officers appointed under the ndps act authorized under the ndps act are not strictly police officers in terms of the police act they are deemed to be police officers for the limited purpose of section 25 of the evidence act and therefore the statement recorded by such an officer is not at all admissible after tofan singh now no confession made to an officer either to the police or an officer under the act is admissible as a confession under section 24 of the evidence act that chapter is now well established that is over now very same argument was advanced in vijay madan lal in vijay madan lal it was argued by the government that no he is not even deemed to be a police officer who the ed officer he is not even deemed to be a police officer and therefore section 25 of the evidence act is not at all applicable it is the statement is recorded in section 50 is not hit by section 25 two things you may see they have already held that article 23 is not a bar now they have said that section 25 is also not a bar and therefore section 162 is not a bar because it is not a statement record on section 161 what the net result the statement record on section 50 is substantive piece of evidence confession admissible under section 24 of the evidence act though we have been saying that a confession itself will confession is weak piece of evidence in common parlance no law says that it cannot be the foundation for conviction no law says it is a foundation for conviction if it in, what is the only language that we use in judgment when it inspires the fullest confidence of the court that can be the basis for conviction now in pmla cases this danger of this statement being used as substantive evidence and conviction is conviction being recorded solely on the basis of <coughs> the said confession made to an ed officer cannot be ruled out but in vijay madan lal having said at one place that he is not a police officer and therefore he is uh, the the statement recorded by him he is not hit by section 25 of the act the court has also held on case basis you see this is the language used authorities under the pmla are not police officer that is dealt with in paragraph 72 take 72 172 now having said that the court should have confirmed that no they are not police officer they are not even deemed a police officer therefore it is admissible you could have said very well no fancying is not applicable we are able to distinguish no issue on that but having come to this conclusion you may kindly consider in paragraph 172 again the court says like this see I, I you may kindly permit me to read paragraph 172 also with this i will close my lecture in other words there is a stark distinction between the scheme of ndps act dealt with by this court in tofan singh and that in the provisions of 2002 that the pmla act under consideration thus it must follow that the authorities under the pmla are not police officers all right <coughs> therefore section 25 is not applicable finished then not the court did not stop here it proceeds further yet consequently the statements recorded by the authorities under the pmla of persons involved in commission of offence of money laundering or the witnesses for the purpose of inquiry investigation cannot be hit by vice of article 23 of the constitution 
or for that matter article 21 being procedure established by law no issue on that because at the time when the statement is made he is not an accused therefore 20 is not applicable Then please kindly see in a given case i am reading the last four lines with a very very important in paragraph 172 in a given case whether the protection given to the accused who is being prosecuted for the offence of money laundering of section 25 of the evidence act is available or not may have to be considered on case to case basis being rule of evidence so i am highly confused of this you already said in the earlier part of 172 that he is not a police officer he is not even deemed to be a police officer so fancing principle is not applicable then how section 25 can be decided on case to case basis having said so <coughs> please kindly see in a given case whether the protection given to the accused who is being prosecuted for the offence of money laundering that is protection of section 25 of the evidence act is available or not may have to be considered on case to case basis being rule of evidence therefore if you apply these last four lines it is still available for us no need to hit by section 25 of the evidence act don't apply this do not admit this in evidence on what basis can we say we have to again say that he is deemed to be a police officer in the earlier paragraph you have said no 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 he is not a police officer or deemed police officer then how can in a in a on a case to case basis how this can be decided therefore friends section 50 any statement record as of now any statement recorded from an accused or from any witness under section 50 by the authority is admissible in evidence this can again be a basis for for opposing the bail but only one thing the applicability of section 30 of the evidence act is not ruled out i think that uh, time is up therefore it is a time for me to close my 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 lecture so in conclusion i will say that this act is said to be a draconian act do in vijay magal lal the honorable supreme court has held that it is not impossible to get bail practically we find it difficult to get bail at least if not impossible very very difficult to get bail the rule that bail is the rule and jail is an exception practically it has been given a go by so far as pmla act cases are concerned and keeping all these things and the burden of proof even at the stage of bail the burden to show is not on the accused it is my humble view it is only on the ed by keeping all these things let us think it over further and develop the law so as to benefit the society for a moment before conclude i will say i am not here to defend your real culprit he is not see the whole effort is that under our system under our constitution whether a person has committed a crime or not used to be tested only by giving him sufficient opportunity and by holding holding a full trial only after that if a person is convicted then okay he can impose any punishment which is authorized by law so our effort is that let there be no procedure that is followed to defeat the well established principles of law and the constitutional guarantees given to an accused that is our effort thank you so much this is part 2 only sir Uh, thank you very much, sir. So much of enlightenment uh, arrest and bail in PMLA cases. Uh, recently, week last week also announced uh, the government of India will give a civilian awards to highest civilian awards to our citizens. Friday group will give you a small standing ovation. The way you have uh, <laughs> give a standing ovation. <laughs> Yes, we have, sir.
YouTube viewers and all criminal. Thank you very much sir, the enlightened and every Friday group member, those who are watching on YouTube also, they will become soldiers in uh, PMLA cases sir. It's the right time also. We too am chasing you. But somehow because of holy we missed you. Uh, so thank you very much sir. Now I request Geetanjali Sharma, we will give you a vote of thanks. Geetanjali, please take this. Come. 210th Friday group meeting friends. Just when we think the Friday group has reached a landmark, we reach it and to create another one. With all humility and delight at my command, I thank our beloved uh, Senior Advocate Nagamutu Sir, Justice Retired, for delivering yet another enlightening lecture, lucid, succinct and oh so relevant. PMLA, ED, money laundering, intricacies, peculiarities and inconsistencies thereof uh, is something the whole country in general and Delhi in particular has been talking about and seeking clarity and information on, especially in the past 15-20 days. Like always, gratitude and congratulations to Seshagiri Rao sir for being that little lamp which is enough to dispel all the darkness. Thank you to all the members of the Friday group for being the constant column of support and cooperation in helping Friday group forge ahead. Sincere regards to all the attendees. It's your presence with which we measure our success. Thank you all once again. Thank you, Gitanjali. Now we'll go for any questions. Yeah, please. Request. Sir, it is a conclusion. You said it is conclusive.